And the Lord said unto Abram, and this is, this, is the, this is the opening of the story, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And this is one of those phrases where every clause is significant. Go somewhere you don't understand. That's the first thing. Get thee out of thy country. You know, back in the 1920s, there was a whole slew of American writers who ended up as expatriates in Paris, Hemingway among them, and, uh, the, and who wrote The Great Gatsby. Fitzgerald, yes, and then a variety of others. It was very inexpensive in Paris at the time, and part of their transformation into great literary figures was the fact that they were out of their country and now they could see what their country was because you can't see what your country is until you leave it so you have to go into the unknown and that's that's God's first command go into the unknown because you already know what you know and so and that's not enough unless you think you're enough and if you're not enough and you don't think you're enough then you have to go where you haven't been and so that's the first commandment to Abraham, it's like, okay, that, that's a good one. That makes perfect sense. Go to where you don't know. Yes. And from thy kindred. Well, that, what does that mean? It means grow up. Right? That's what it means. It means get away from your family enough so that you can establish your independence. And that isn't because there's something wrong with your family, although perhaps there is, you know, as there is perhaps wrong with you. But it means get away. You know, I talk to people very frequently whose families have provided them with too much protection and they know it themselves and that means they're deprived of necessity you know one of the things that you see in, in, in the United States for example is that um, the children of first generation immigrants often do better than the children than, the, than their children and the reason for that is that the children of first generation Im immigrants have necessity driving them and you don't know how much you need necessity to drive you because maybe you're not very disciplined and if and a catastrophe doesn't immediately befall you if you don't act forthrightly today, then maybe you never act forthrightly, right? Because the, the, the gap between your foolishness and the punishment is, is lengthened by your unearned wealth, and so you never grow up and learn, and you have to get yourself away from your dependency in order to allow necessity to drive you forward. And that's to become independent and to become mature. And I think part of what's happening in our culture is that the... The, the force that's attacking the, the forthright movement forward of young men in particular is afraid of the power of men because it's confused about the distinction between power and authority and competence. Like, an, a man who's, who has authority and competence has power as a byproduct, but the authority and competence is everything. And, and, and people who can't understand that fail to make the distinction between power and authority of competence, and they're afraid of power, and so they destroy authority and competence. And that's a terrible thing, because we need authority and competence. What else is going to, what else is going to allow us to prevail in the long run? And so you get away from your country, and you get away from your kin, and from your father's house, right? And you go out there and you establish yourself in the world. It's a call to adventure. That's what this... The, the first lines in the Abrahamic story is a call to adventure. So, great, unto a land that I will show you. Well, you know, what does that mean? You know, one of the things that I've been struck very hard by a number of writers, Carl Jung, obviously among them. I mean, he, he wrote things like Nietzsche that, if you understand them, they just break you into pieces, you know? And, and one of the things that Jung understood and the psychoanalysts understand is one of the most terrifying elements of psychoanalytic thinking is very tightly allied with religious thinking, which is that you are not the master of your own house. There are spirits that dwell in you, within you, meaning you have a will and you can exercise a certain amount of conscious control over your being, but there are all sorts of things that occur within you that seem to be beyond your capacity to control. Your dreams, for example, that's a really good example. Or your impulses, for example. You might, you might think of those as so foreign from you that they're not even, you don't even want them to be part of you. But, but more subtly even, how about what you're interested in? What compels you? Like, where does that come from? Exactly. Because you can't, you can't conjure it up of your own accord, you know? So, if you're a student and you're taking a difficult course, you might say to yourself, well, I need to sit down and study for three hours. But then you sit down and that isn't what happens. Your attention goes everywhere. And you might say, well, whose attention is it then if it goes everywhere? 
Because you say it's your attention, it's like, well, if it's your attention, maybe you would be able to control it, but you can't. And so then you might think, well, Jen, just exactly what the hell is controlling it? And you might say, well, it's random. It's the, well, it better not be random. I can tell you that. That's, that happens to some degree in schizophrenia. There's an element of randomness in that. It's not random. It's driven by the action of, of phenomena that I think are best considered as something like subpersonalities, although even that's only a partial description. You can't make yourself interested in something. Interest manifests itself and grips you. That's a whole different thing. And so what is it that's gripping you? And, and how do you conceptualize that? Is that a divine power? Well, it's divine as far as you're concerned, because it grips you, and you can't do anything about it. And so, there's a calling in you towards what you're compelled by and what you're interested in, and sometimes that might be very dark, and sometimes not. But you're compelled forward by your interest. And so, and so the idea that what moves you away from your country and your father's house and the comforts of your childhood home is, is something that's beyond you and that you listen to and hearken to. That's exactly right. And you can say, well, I don't want to call that God. It's like, it doesn't matter what you call it, exactly. It, it doesn't matter to what it is, what it's called. It still is. And if you don't listen to it, that's the other thing. If you don't listen to it, and I've been a clinician and talked to enough people now, as old as I am, to know this absolutely. If you do not listen to that thing that beckons you forward, you will pay for it like you cannot possibly imagine. You'll have everything that's terrible about life in your life and nothing about it that's good. And worse, you'll know that it was your fault and that you squandered what you could have had. So, this is not only a calling forth, but a warning unto a land that I will show thee, and, and that's it, that I will show thee. That, and you don't want to be too concrete about this, you know. There's all sorts of new territories that you can inhabit if you... There's, there's abstract and conceptual territories. If you go to university and you study biology or you study physics or, or any discipline, you're in a territory, right? You're in the territory that all the scholars have established, and then as you master the discipline, you move out beyond the established territory into the unknown, and, and that's a new land, right? Maybe it's even a land of your enemies, for that matter, but it's a new land, and the frontier is always in front of you. And so, you know, when the earth was less inhabited than it is now, the frontier was... The psychological frontier and the geographical frontier was the same thing, and now they've separated to some degree because there's not so much geographical frontier. But there's, the frontier is a place that never disappears, and the land that's beyond the land that you know is always there, and it's always where you should go. And all of that's packed into these, what, four phrases. So, well, so, when I've been thinking about narrative, you look at the world through a story. You can't, you can't help it. And, and the story is what gives value to the world, or, or the story is what you extract from the value of the world. You can look at it either way. You're somewhere, and it's not good enough. Right? That's the eternal human predicament. Wherever you are isn't good enough. And to some degree, that's actually a good thing, because if it was good enough, well, <laughs> there's nothing for you to do. So it's actually maybe a good thing that it's insufficient. And that might be why sometimes having less is, is better than having more. And I don't want to be a Pollyanna about that. I mean, I know that there's deprivation that can reach to the point where it's, no, where it's completely counterproductive. But it isn't always the case that starting with little is... You, if you start with little, you start with more possibility. It's something like that. So you move from always from what's unbearable about the present to some better future, right? And if you don't have that, then you have, no, you have nothing but threat and... A negative emotion. You have no positive emotion, because the positive emotion is generated in the conception of the better future and then the evidence that you generate yourself that you're moving towards it. That's where the positive and fulfilling meaning of life comes. So you want to set up this structure properly. It's very, very important. And so what it means is that you want to be going somewhere that's good enough so that the going is worth the while. And you can ask yourself that, and that's partly what we tried to build into the Future Authoring Program, which is, well, we know what's wrong with life. It's rife with suffering and insufficiency and deception and evil. It's all of that, obviously. Okay, what would make the journey worthwhile? Well, you can ask yourself that. It's like, all right, in order to bear up under this load, what is it that I would need to be striving to attain? And if you ask yourself that, that's to knock and 
and the door will open. That's what that means. If you ask yourself that, then you will find an answer, and you'll think, you'll shrink away from it. You'll think, well, there's no way I could do that. It's like, well, you don't know what you could do. You don't know what's possible. And you're not as much as you could be. And so God only knows what you could, what you could do and have and give if you sacrificed everything to it. And that's the reason Abraham is constantly making sacrifices. And it's archaic, right? He's burning up like baby lambs. But like, well, they're alive. You know, that's something. And, and they're valuable and that's something. It's, you have to admit, even if you think about it as a modern person, that the act of sacrificing something might have some dramatic compulsion to it. You know, to go out into a flock and to take something that's newborn and to cut its throat and to bleed it and to burn it might be a way of indicating to yourself that you're actually serious about something. And it isn't so obvious that we have rituals of seriousness like that now. And so it's not so obvious that we're actually serious about anything. And so maybe that's not such a good thing. And so maybe we shouldn't be thinking that these people were so archaic and primitive and superstitious. It's possible that they knew something that we don't. And certainly in the Abrahamic stories, one of the things that maintains Abraham's covenant with God is his continual willingness to sacrifice. It's so, that sacrificial issue is so important because you are not committed to something unless you're willing to sacrifice for it. Commitment and sacrifice are the same thing. And I think it's, it borders on miraculous that those concepts are embedded into this narrative at the level of dramatic action. You know, instead of abstract explanation, people are acting this out. And, then the, and the fundamental conception is so profound that it's really quite, it's quite awe-inspiring. It's, it's breathtaking, really, when you understand what message is trying to be conveyed. You have to make sacrifices. And what do you have to sacrifice? You have to sacrifice that which is most valuable to you currently that's stopping you. And God only knows what that is. It's certainly the worst of you. It's certainly that. And God only knows to what degree you're in love with the worst of you. So...